Welcome back to the Popper Metagame. Today I'm going to say two words that will excite some of you, terrify others, and annoy yet others. Those two words are Popper Ponza. That's right, we're going to cover the obscure Popper Ponza deck. This is really not a tier 1 deck. It's not even tier 2. I don't even know if this is tier 3 to be honest with you. But uh, Saffron Olive put together, by the way, Saffron Olive from uh, the uh, MTG Goldfish uh, article series. He does different decks and whatnot, and he's thrown some popper decks out there. He published a little article and did a video on, on this back on May the 4th, 2018. And I believe uh, he actually went 4-1 and one with this list. I have to be honest, I really don't recommend that you play Ponza in Popper. I just think over the long run, it's probably not going to be your best option for trying to make tickets. Now, if you just want to have some fun and you're not terribly concerned about where you end up net-net on your tickets, then hey, by all means roll it out there because you can have some fun games for sure. So what I'm going to do is we're going to break this down. First, I'm going to give you an overall rating of the deck, which I've already started into. Then we're going to talk about some of the cards specifically in the deck and some interactions. And then in part three, last, we will talk about some of the interactions you're going to see in other matchups. So part one, overall rating. I give this, so I have sort of an A, B, C rating scale. And I think this deck is probably like C minus or something like that overall. And yeah, it's just you got real problems with your consistency and there's certain matchups you can probably win but you can get blown out what I mean by consistency is you're just gonna get some hands where you have an Uamog Crusher and a Mold Shambler and a bunch of lands and Acid Moss and you know I don't know something like that and you're gonna be in a position where you're just basically going to get blown out because you don't have early land destruction and a lot of decks operate just fine on two or three mana at least enough to cause you some major problems so yeah that's it's if you get the perfect opening hand where you get a wild growth or a utopia sprawl along with a arbor elf that come down on your first couple of turns you're going to do some really explosive stuff you can lock your opponent out of ever having more than one mana and run away with the game and that's certainly something that's possible but it's just going to be very swingy if you are going to play this deck you're going to have to be comfortable with that and that's one of the main reasons i give this deck a c minus is just lack of consistency also there's a lot of different ways you could build this so it's possible when you get the right tuned list this becomes something more like a oh i don't know maybe something like a uh, maybe a, a b or a c plus style deck I just don't think this is ever going to be tier one. Um, there was a modern Ponza deck that I uh, believe took down some major tournament maybe a month or two ago or something like that. This is just not something that's going to be able to be duplicated in Popper most likely, at least not with the cards we have available right now. All right, well, let's go ahead and dive in and look at some of the cards. Arbor Elf is a very important card in the deck because if you drop a turn one Arbor Elf with along with a forest, on turn two, you can put a Utopia Sprawl or a Wild Growth on another forest. Uh, well, I guess I should say if you if you have two forests in play on your second turn, which is doable, you just tap one of your forests and put a Wild Growth or a Utopia Sprawl on the untapped forest, then tap it for two mana, untap it with the Arbor Elf, and now you actually have four mana on your second turn, which means you can quite easily turn to drop an Amon, Amon what is this, Monvuli Acid Moss, also, really, you can turn to Thermokarst off of either just a Utopia Sprawl, just a Wild Growth, or just an Arbor Elf. So that's kind of nice if you have Thermokarst in your opening hand. Beyond that, one of the things you can do is you can, if you're able to turn to the Acid Moss, you're going to be able to, Acid Moss for four mana destroys a land and it also lets you search your library for a forest and put it into play. So basically what happens is on turn two, you Acid Moss. Now you're searching up another land. And then if you hit your following land drop on turn three, it means you can actually drop a Kicked Mold Shambler for six mana on your third turn. So you can effectively lock your opponent out of having any land without even having a Thermokarst. 
and your opponent never gets more than one mana if you get a perfect start which basically revolves around getting an arbor elf down if you have a thermocarst in your opening hand you're in good business but you're not always going to have even though you do have some redundancy you're not always going to have those circumstances come together the other problem this particular list has is you don't really have any removal so if your opponent manages to stick a problematic threat you're going to have some problems you don't have a ton of real card advantage you do have things like mold shambler that are killing a land and giving you a body this list is utilizing crows and tusker to be able to draw a card and get a land and we also have the acid moss that destroys land and gets you land along with reap and so to destroy a land and get a land and then uh, these are basically your options for deck thinning which is a little bit of sort of card advantage if you stick an ulamog crusher being able to eat your opponent and you if you get an attack you know an eight mana eight eight with annihilator two you're going to eat two of your opponent's permanents every time you attack so you can get some virtual card advantage that way so basically what we're doing here we're leaning on the utopia sprawl and wild growth these are just enchantments you put on land to get an extra mana when the land is tapped and then we're leaning on arbor elf to be able to also accelerate so we have three separate mana accelerators that uh, have some nice interactions because uh, arbor elf can really really juice these mana enchantments the nice thing about utopia sprawl and wild growth is while there's a lot of creature creature removal out there there's not a ton of land kill so usually you're fairly safe and ramping with these enchantments the mold shambler is pretty cool one of the things to keep in mind with the mold shambler its kicker allows you to have a come into play destroy target non-creature permanent it's important to remember not to just go full autopilot and always blow up lands every once in a while there's going to be an artifact or an enchantment that you can kill to get some value so keep in mind that you do have options besides just blowing up lands with mold shambler greater sandworm is just a cycling beater that can't be chumped very easily you can cycle it out early on if you just don't have the mana coming up anytime soon and you could use the land crows and tusker is a seven mana six five it cycles for three but when you cycle it you're able to search your library for a basic land which is kind of nice ulamog crusher is really your premier finisher in this deck and this list has four Sprout Swarm I think is really interesting because you generate quite a bit of mana. So I think Sprout Swarm is cool because it lets you chump early. You can build up some inevitability late. I think it's pretty cool and worth testing. Thermokarst is your only three mana land kill in the deck. And then we already talked about Acid Moss, Reap and Sow. And um, the other thing we've got here is some copies of Reclaiming Vines, which again, just like the Mold Shambler Reclaiming Vines, can destroy things besides land so reclaiming vines is a four mana sorcery that lets you destroy an artifact enchantment or land for those of you who remember creeping mold it's basically creeping mold but a common which is kind of cool we've got 18 forests which is not a ton of land especially with all the really expensive cost of things that we have but because we have four copies of wild growth four utopia sprawls and four arbor elves even though we're only running 18 forests effectively half of our deck is mana sources so that's just fine sideboard here gut shot nature's claim nil spell bomb and scattershot archer so this is fine i don't think this is an optimized list and i'm going to show you another list that i just sort of threw together because there's not a ton of these ponza decks on mtg goldfish so here's a list that i i don't really recommend that you run per se i don't think this is optimized either but it just gives you a sense of another route you could take with this deck I have a feeling that again this is not optimal either I ran this through a league I, I think I went like two and three it wasn't that impressive but the deck was fun and it felt okay and I felt like with some more tweaking it could it could be reasonably decent so we're running four ash barons along with three snow covered mountains and utopia sprawl can also produce red mana so between all of that we've actually got 10 red sources of mana we've also i've also got four copies of faithless looting the one interesting thing about building a ponza deck with red mana i think this is just the best uh, utilization i've really seen as far as really getting the most out of faithless looting out of um, 
the various decks I've seen Faithless Looting in, it can be pretty good. One of the reasons it's so good in a deck like this is because you're you're going to have, even if you're only running 18 land, and on this iteration I've actually got 22 land, I think this would probably be better if I scaled back to 19 or 20 and then actually did add in the wild growths. So I just kind of slapped this together to give you a sense. This is, again, not a tuned list at all. But the idea is you've got so much mana where you're going to have basically half your deck as mana. You really want to be able to hit a few early sources, and then after that, you're just going to flood out a lot. So being able to chunk all those lands to Faithless Looting is going to be really helpful. Also, you might run into some games where your opponent has just been able to build up a lot of land despite your land destruction, and by the time you start drawing enough land destruction to try to claw back your opponent's lands, it may just be a moot point. So being able to Faithless Looting away land destruction spells is actually something occasionally you might need to do. And Faithless Looting also gives you the option to just dig for more land if you happen to open a hand where you've got a mountain and a forest and you just don't really have any of the other accelerators that you need. You can just start chunking things to Faithless Looting to really get rocking. Because this deck really gets a lot of its wins from getting that land destruction going very quickly. And Faithless Looting can help smooth out what you need to get that going. Other than that, I've just added some Firebolts. We're able to Firebolt 1 mana, deal 2 damage to any target, flashback for 5. And with all the mana we generate in this deck, Firebolt is able to flashback pretty quickly, and it's nice against all of the flyers that are floating around out there. It gives you some game against some aggro decks that might be able to even operate on 1 mana and just ignore your land destruction and just start beating you really hard early. Some some firebolts here, along with some Screds. I, I'm utilizing Snowlands, so with Scred we can actually blow up some, you know, for for example, maybe you're blowing up all your opponent's land and they jam a, a Gurmag Angler, because with a big enough graveyard you only need one mana to deploy a Gurmag Angler. Well, it's not really that tough to get to five mana with a deck like this and be able to Scred off something like a Gurmag Angler. We have the Arbor Elf, which is just a must-include. Utopia Sprawl, which is a must-include. Again, I should probably have some Wild Growths in here by trimming back to probably also 18 or 19 land. And then Thermokarst is a must-include because it's your only three-costed land destruction. The Monvuli Acid Moss is really important as well because it blows up mana for four and it ramps you. And then Mold Chambler is pretty good. You might be able to go to three Mold Chamblers, but it's pretty good, so I don't know. The Ulamog Crushers, I'm actually just running two of these just because it's really crummy to have a couple of these in your opening hand. Although you could potentially run the four just because Faithless Looting smooths out a lot of problems. Um, I've also got some Penumbra Spiders, which I really like. This has just been good against a lot of things. It's good against all the Flyers. It's good against, you know... Uh, heavy aggro decks because you get that the the two four body is just really good against a lot of things the reach makes it good against a lot of things against affinity it's not really that great but you still get two chumps against any of their four fours and uh, perhaps you could even get two penumbra spiders down and double block although they'll probably blow up one of your blockers but it's hard for your opponent to really get a really good effective two for one just because you're gonna get another body back anyway. So I do like Penumbra Spider. It's good against a lot of things. Uh, you might be just strictly better off cutting another one of these for an Ulamog Crusher, just because you don't have to be as desperate to have a quality blocker with the removal cards that you've got available. But you know, it's just another option I wanted to point out for anybody that's evaluating a deck like this. One of the spicy things we have at the top end is Rolling Thunder, just because between all of the ramp that we have, we can get a fair bit of mana. And Rolling Thunder is a way for us to get some more virtual card advantage. If we're able to get a three or four for one off of Rolling Thunder, that's really good. And it might even be worth rolling four copies of Rolling Thunder. The only reason I'm running three is because I do only have 10 red sources of mana in the deck. So there are some occasions where you know, we've got to get to turn 7, 8, 9, 10 before we get our uh, second red source. But again, with Faithless Looting, you know, this allows us, if we have a Rolling Thunder in our opening hand that we can't do anything with, we can chunk it to a Faithless Looting. Or if we're trying to find our second red source, Faithless Looting can help us with that as well. So 
I uh, I really can't speak highly enough of Faithful Saluting in my testing for this deck, just because it's so situational that the cards that you need are often extremely good. When you need a removal card, you really need a removal card. When you need land destruction early, you really need it early. When you need land early, you really need it. But a lot of these cards are just not that essential. For example, there might be situations where you've got a couple of firebolts in your hand and you could they're not doing anything because your opponent doesn't have any land. You've been hitting your land destruction game plan and what you really need is a finisher. And so Faithless Looting can come into play there. Also, again, it helps out with smoothing. It just does a lot of things to clean up the variance. And one of the reasons we have so much more variance with a deck like this, I guess I should explain. Normally, you're operating along an axis of having land, creatures, removal, card draw, tricks, these kinds of things. But when you're running a deck like this, you've got land, you've got accelerators, you've got land destruction, you've got finishers, and with our version we've even got removal. So those are just a ton of different component parts. Basically just adding the extra dynamic of having the land destruction adds another factor, another type of card you need that is very situational because again there's just going to be some games where your opponent has two or three lands and they've already got a bunch of threats on board and the utility of blowing up their third land is is just not really that relevant versus trying to dig for a rolling thunder or something like that against a really quick aggressive aggro deck so that's basically the list and I'll take you I'll take a minute here just to kind of talk about the sideboard that I've put together some of the options one of the nice things about tapping into red is because then you can get copies of electricery in your sideboard which is good against so many things right now fairies elves so on and so forth pyroblast gives you game against blue decks you can perhaps if your opponent say is able to hold up, hold up counter magic you can make sure you get an extra red mana available to both blow up your opponent's lands and back it up with a pyroblast that's pretty good also uh, we have you know different things that we've already got in our main deck you could add the fourth rolling thunder to your sideboard I'm just running three rolling thunders and I'm also just running three fireball and three scred so you could have extra copies of those if you wanted there's a lot of different uh, other hate options you've got. Red also gives you access to things like Stone Rain and Rays and other land destruction options as well that you could potentially experiment with. And in addition to that, you've got, because we're still in green, Moments Peace is interesting. You might want to have uh, something to blow up all of your uh, opponent's enchantments. Let's see. So let's see here, like go oh, tranquility, for example, is something you could you could potentially tinker around with. Reverent silence is interesting. It's basically if you control a forest rather than pay four mana to destroy all enchantments, you can just let your opponent gain six life and cast this for free. So something like that is an available option. And as always, with the way the metagame is right now, I think that serrated arrows can be uh, a nice inclusion against any of the fairies you might run into. So. I don't, again, this is not tuned. This is something that you'd still have to feel out, but this basically lays out what you're looking at. So as far as looking at key matchups, let's see here. Against your, your matchup, if you if you actually have the, the red-green version, some iteration of that, along with potentially some Penumbra Spiders, you're going to have a reasonable game against Is It Delver. They're going to have a very hard time dealing with your threats effectively. Mono Blue Delver is actually going to have a better game against you just because they have the bounce options, and they're going to be more likely to have Daze. Daze is quite good against your land destruction because... If they daze your land destruction spell by paying the alternative cost of bouncing their island back to their hand, even if you can pay the one mana that daze requires, they're going to effectively fizzle your land destruction spell anyway because they just bounce their land back to their hand. This is negative tempo for them, but they're going to have these various options to work around your land destruction. So unless you can follow up with an Ulamog's Crusher really quickly, eventually they're going to be able to start executing their tempo game plan. So it has a lot to do with how these draws unfold. Um, I think if you're playing the mono green version, you really, really need Penumbra Spider to have a reasonable shot there. 
it's still not necessarily going to be the greatest matchup because they can just bounce your spiders. With red green and having arrows in the sideboard, I think it's a little more doable, but it's still going to be a little bit tricky. Is it Delver? I actually think your matchup is is just fine, especially if with the red green version or extra serrated arrows. Against Tron, you're going to have a really good time because you're going to be able to blow up their Tron pieces, so that's going to be quite good. Stompy is going to have a reasonable shot at going underneath your land destruction. However, again, Penumbra Spider is pretty good here because if you're able to blow up enough of their land to keep them on one mana most of the time, they're not going to be able to really just accelerate too quickly and then you can gum up the board by turn three or four where they don't have great attacks and you're, you're going to be able to basically grind them out. Koldotha Boros is a little bit tricky. It's weird because they really do need their mana. They dirtle, they tap a lot of mana. They're spending a lot of time playing an artifact and then bouncing it back and recasting it and spending four mana to cantrip and drop a creature. So blowing up their land is is very important. On the other hand, if you can't really get them locked reasonably well, they have a lot of cantrips and card draws. So once they get going, they're probably going to be able to draw enough land to nullify a lot of your game plan to uh, make your land destruction work out really well. They also have situationally, depending on how their draws play out, they have answers to most things because they've got Journey to Nowhere along with Burn. And it's just one of those things that depends on how well you execute your land destruction plan. Against blue black control you actually have a reasonably good game potentially uh, especially because these mid-range and control decks really need their mana and they're not most of these are not putting a really quick clock on you even the Gurmag Angler versions need time to be able to deploy those Gurmag Anglers to build up cards in their graveyard and whatnot. Inside out combo is tricky because they don't need a ton of mana they can really execute their combo just off of two mana so being able to have some other options, I think having some red options, uh, this is probably one of the reasons why Saffron Olive had Gut Shot in his sideboard, even on a mono green version. Against Elves, having Electricery out of the board is really nice. Elves is one of those decks that's tricky to deal with. If you're running the mono green version, you're going to be in big trouble because there's, they have plenty of mana elves. So even blowing up their land isn't necessarily going to get you out of there. And Quirion Ranger effectively allows them to just bounce their forests all the time every time you try to blow them up. So you're going to have a miserable time against elves unless you've got some red removal, some electricries, fire blast, scred, some of that kind of stuff to keep them off balance. You could also see Rolling Thunder be a real all-star in that matchup. Affinity is going to be a little bit tough because they have so many ways to accelerate and come out quickly and their 4-4s four just line up, you know, quick 4-4s four line up really well with what you're trying to do. So they're, they're definitely going to give you some fits. You're going to want to have some kind of appropriate sideboard answers. I, I had some Fangren Marauders in my sideboard I was tinkering with and I never ran into Affinity in the, in the very small amount that I played this deck, so I don't know if that is really worthwhile or not. And then again, Tron, you've got a great matchup. Pestilence is also really dirtily and slow, and blowing up their lands is going to set them back quite a bit. Like most of these mid-range control decks, they can't put a particularly quick clock on you. You're going to have a pretty reasonable matchup on just by attritioning their lands and interfering with their game plan. Is a Blitz is tough because they can just kill you on two mana. They also typically have Gush and days so they can bounce their lands and it's just not really a fun matchup no matter what you're doing. Burn is pretty capable of operating off of one and two mana so it's not great. This is a situation where having some kind of a sideboard answer to this would probably be a good idea. Aggro Red, this is a situation where the Penumbra Spider really shines because they're rocking Chain Lightning and Lightning Bolt. These do not line up well against the Penumbra Spider. They do typically have some combination of things like Reckless Abandon and Fire Blast, but even then, if they have to sack their land just to deal with your Penumbra Spider, you're going to be doing pretty well. They have a lot of creatures that do cost more than one mana, but they do typically have quite a few one drops. Although keep in mind the Bushwhacker is really a two drop because to get his kicker effect they need two mana. The other thing is attacking into a Penumbra Spider with all of these two twos is just going to be great for you. 
even if they have some combination of attack with a 2-2 and then play lightning bolt on your spider or use mutagenic growth or something like that you're still gonna get a two for one on the front end and then you get another spider token on the back end so for them to get through your spider they might have to burn as many as three four five cards something crazy like that so penumbra spider is also really good in this matchup even though the reach doesn't matter boggles is tricky it's weird because they could just blow you out without you really being able to to stop them if they are able to deploy something like a an early one drop followed by an ethereal armor and a rancor suddenly they're going to be able to quickly develop a threat even just off of one mana here and there that's going to be very difficult for you to deal with on the other hand they do tend to run utopia sprawl and abundant growth that they're throwing on their lands so you can claw back some value against them by blowing up their lands and thus destroying their enchantments which weakens their ethereal armor and their ancestral masks however regardless of whether you're playing red green or mono green they're going to be able to scale their creatures past your threats fairly quickly even off of a very limited amount of mana and if you're playing the red green version they're going to be able to scale past your ability to blow them up with your targeted removal if your targeted removal could even land because most of the time they're putting it on hexproof creatures but even when they put it on a Heliod's Pilgrim or something random like a Kalani Garden 01 plant token they're still going to be spending a lot of time uh, or they're still a lot of the time going to be able to scale past your your burn removal Electricery is a is an all-star here if you're able to basically threat threaten them with land destruction where they can't sandbag they really have to come right out the gate and start deploying their creatures and their threats so if they deploy a glade clover scout and then they go to jam an ethereal armor and in response you electricery that's going to be a pretty good game for you so it's tough to say a lot of the times there if your if your draws aren't perfect they're probably going to beat you and even sometimes when your draws are perfect if they have the perfect you know supply of mana they might just be able to get you anyway the uh, the mono black uh, matchup is something you should do well in just because so many of mono black's cards cost a lot of mana I mean you have a lot of their cards cost three mana crypt rats ch uh, chittering rats phyrexian rager these are all three mana if they have any thorn in the black rose those are four gray merchant of asphodels five a lot of their a lot of their sorceries and instants cost two mana they've got even got oubliette at three and it's just a lot of dirtling so if you're able to keep them on one and two mana they're not going to be able to execute very much other than maybe at some point deploy a gurmag angler but by the time they do that you can probably uh, figure out some way to 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 m muddle up the board and keep that from being a very effective threat against you so there will be some times when your land destruction just doesn't come together uh, it's tricky because if you run too much land destruction you're gonna have situations where you don't draw what you need as far as having real threats or other targeted removal to deal with what sneaks in under your land destruction on the other hand if you don't have enough land destruction in your deck then you're not going to be able to effectively deploy your strategy of jamming them up early by blowing up their lands and keeping them from being able to execute an effective game plan so it can be very tricky this goes back to that whole variance problem where you really want to have two three maybe four land destruction spells and that's it sort of like how most aggro decks want to hit basically two to three mana and that's all they after that they just want to draw action so again something like faithless looting is helpful uh, to smooth these things out and help your game plan come out the way you want it to all right so that's popper ponza i don't just to be clear i don't recommend you play it but i've seen some people talking about it again saffron olive the always popular one uh, did a video and an article on that i'll try to remember to link that in the notes to this video but it is popper ponza is a lot of fun and because there's not a ton of land destruction decks out there in popper i think you uh, can find a mono black land destruction is something that floats around a little bit from time to time but there's not a ton of land destruction deck options so if you are someone who just really enjoys blowing up people's lands and ruining people's days making sure they can't execute any game plan at all and they're stuck on discard because they cannot deploy any threats well you could play popper ponza it's, it's not tier one but it's out there if you're going to play against it then 
uh, you know, you, you, you can have some sense of the axis it's going to operate on and plan accordingly. I really would not suggest uh, game planning or dedicating any real sideboard slots to it because it's just so fringe in the metagame right now. But if it happens to get a few more cards that it needs to get even better over the course of time, it's something that you can keep in mind as new cards flood into the format with each new set. That's it for today, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day. And as always, hopefully each of the popper leagues that you're playing in will uh, result in 5-0 uh, league results for you. Peace.